Randall del USF College of Global Sustainability. I'm Dave Randall, and I work with students to transform the world through sustainable tourism. Well, I got started in sustainability at the very first Earth Day in 1970. I was fortunate to work with leading experts on sustainability from around the world and uh, was one of the six leaders of the 150-person global environment team at the Earth Summit. So I have a lot of personal experience and background, and I've lived in diverse tourism settings. I grew up in Southern California, but I also lived in a little town of Kanab, Utah, surrounded by national parks, Bryce, Zion, the Grand Canyon, Lake Powell, recreation area. I've consulted with a major tourism, ski and summer resort. So I've seen uh, tourism from many different perspectives. And so that was really kind of a transforming life-changing event for me because it really showed me that I had a real passion to be involved with environmental issues. Sustainable tourism is the, the process of living in a way that preserves the opportunities for future generations. For example, we're at Anna Marie Island, uh, specifically on Pine Avenue, also known as the greenest little main street in America. All of the businesses have come together to beautify the city. The restaurants even take the herbs and spices they grow out of these gardens right into their restaurants. We have a separate program here with the Cortez Fishing Village to promote sustainable seafood. We have a solar business district powered 100% net zero energy with solar energy. Tourism could be one of the best allies for addressing issues like climate change or it could be one of the worst enemies. If tourism is the fastest growing industry in the world and we do not do it more sustainably, we're going to exasperate an already serious problem where things like sea level rise, uh, different changes in rain cycles, and droughts, uh, depletion of food resources, seafood, all of these could be major impacts that will impact the tourism industry if we do not do this right. Tourism has more leverage to change the world than any single industry. There's just so much going on here and students have the opportunity to be part of it and to experience it as part of our program. At USF, we are pioneering and networking on a global level in unique ways in the world. In the interest of time, I'm going to um, significantly abbreviate my presentation, so the slides will, in many cases, become bullet points, and so please excuse the brevity, but in the interest of time and giving the other panel members a chance, um, something that we need to do. But I want to frame this session on sustainable food and gastronomy with the science of the planetary boundaries. We had a great presentation this morning on climate change, but climate change is just one of the nine planetary boundaries, and there's other planetary boundaries that play a significant role. In our sustainable tourism observatory, we have developed a model to incorporate that where we start with the four pillars of the GSTC criteria and then create sustainable social structures and use 12 strategies, you can Google the blue community strategies, to create safe and just space for humanity and a just and sustainable economic uh, development within the limitations of planetary boundaries. So this is different than the traditional model of trying to balance the social, economic, environmental, because there really is no such thing as balancing when you have limits of how much CO2 can go in the atmosphere and uh, how much nitrogen and phosphorus can go in the oceans. So we're trying to shift that model to be more realistic and more science-based from that uh, perspective. And in terms of food, there's three planetary boundaries that are most significant. Uh, climate change, the nitrogen phosphorus overload, and the biodiversity impacts. And climate change and, and ocean acidification which are factored in with CO2 is significantly important. And we forget how much CO2 goes into the atmosphere from the food industry. It's uh, greater 
than uh, industry and transportation combined. And the specific part of that with cattle is even more significant than other food. But the part of cattle that's more significant is the deforestation. Do you realize the CO2 from eating meat is 25 times greater for the deforestation than is the cattle itself? So that's a significant <coughs> factor to consider. So food production has emissions from animals, it has fertilizer use, it has transportation of food, and it has deforestation to develop cropland. And we can start with the kind of buildings that we put our restaurants and hotels into. This uh, home in Pensacola Beach, Florida, was built by FEMA to resist hurricanes. And a lot of people wish they were in a home like that right now in Florida. Uh, believe me, I can tell you. But they took a direct hit with Hurricane Ivan, a Category 4 hurricane. Everything around them, you can see the bottom picture, was destroyed. They were fine. And um, uh, Xanadu in Belize developed the whole resort with this kind of architecture. And it uh, took a direct hit with Hurricane Keith and not only saved all the tourists, but also the people in the community that had nowhere else to go. So this is an, an opportunity we have. And then we have a, a same structure in Paradise Island in the Bahamas using the same thing. People are talking about the need to use dome structures not just for disaster, but for the heat from climate change that is coming. And this is a, a diagram that shows you one model. Uh, my friend Rick Crandall actually two years ago proposed that they create a dome uh, space restaurant where you can experience outer space while you eat. And I just learned last month that Walt Disney World is actually doing that very thing and that will be open in the next uh, year. Uh, and their transportation system is another thing. How do we get people to our restaurants? How do we get them to our resorts in a more uh, carbon-free way? Uh, one way that they do it is they give people free transportation if they use public transportation. So that's another model. And in Cuba, they use things like bicycle tacky, taxis and horse uh, and buggies, um, pedestrian walkways, and so forth. Many different energy options we can uh, look at as well. Uh, some of the best practices we find in places like Paradise Bay uh, Villas in Grenada, where they actually offer offsets to every customer that comes there. So when you check into their hotel, they say, where did you come from? And they give you a carbon offset for that. But they don't stop there. They say, where are you going while you're here? How can we help you do it with less carbon? Because we're going to pay whatever you do in offsets. So that's another opportunity uh, that uh, can happen from that. And then we have best practices in Tiamo Resort, 100% energy. Hawaii is now committed to be 100% renewable as a state by 2045 and opportunities. A simple one is if you live in a tropical climate or a climate like Florida, you can paint your roof white, coat it white, and that will save you, according to the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories, 20% of your annual energy bills just by doing that. And uh, Walt Disney Company, they have a program that I think we ought to consider at least in our GSTC criteria that they tax every single one of their business units for the carbon they use. So they build in an incentive for um, the business units of the company to be less carbon intensive. And then they take that money and reinvest it in either energy efficiency, conservation, or carbon offsets. And they use the cooking grease from the restaurants to power their uh, steamships, their trains, and even the uh, uh, machinery at their castaway island. They've converted their holiday lighting um, to LEDs, which uses the equivalent of only 12 microwave ovens. And they use simple technology like creating a thermal cooler where the water gets colder at night and then they don't have to cool it for their air conditioning in the day. They take their food waste and turn it into um, energy. 5.4 megawatts of food waste in this biodigester. Um, they also have created a solar farm. Now, I don't know why they would have put it in this shape, but they put it in this shape uh, and produced 5.4 megawatts as well. In biodiversity loss, there's a lot of education we can do. Uh, one of the models that we're working with in our observatory, you saw in the video, is the historic Cortez fishing village, the oldest fishing village in the United States. And the sea change process is to firm values, identify resources, access 
opportunities, create partnerships, innovations, measuring impacts, and replicating the models. So they started this project by respecting the cultural heritage. Uh, in this case, they had resources of abundant gray-striped mullet. Uh, they also found that they could use aquaculture to produce uh, sunray clams and oysters, and they are now looking at how they can add value, uh, like Batarga and multiple uh, products, and then partnerships uh, with marine research and NGOs, new innovations in processing, and new innovations in culinary artistry. They train the chefs in order to make their business more um, sustainable. And finally, collaboration with our university and others to uh, validate their work and get more recognition. They also are sharing it with the community and um, getting a lot of uh, value that way. Another example is the Waves Restaurant um, in Walt Disney World hosts every year an annual sustainable seafood festival where they invite all the chefs in the area to come with their favorite sustainable seafood dish and then you get a little tasting and wine and, and fish and, and make a big festival out of it. Uh, the Guy Harvey Rumfish Grill in our observatory uh, tracks your meal. When you have your fish served, it comes a little tag when you scan the barcode and it'll tell you who caught that fish, where, what was caught, where was it caught, when was it caught, and how it was caught. So that is a new innovation as well. Uh, there's a long story to this wilderness preserve. I won't go into the details for time, but let me just say this project, which I'm happy to share later, is the model wetlands restoration project in the world and where NASA is doing its wetlands research um, as a result. They literally took an old farm and converted it to 12,500 acres of wetland restoration, put in a visitor center that demonstrates all kinds of technologies from geothermal, passive so uh, solar, active solar, and so forth. Um, so many different opportunities from uh, that regard. And there's many more projects. Again, I'm going to, interest of time, skip over. Um, uh, reducing plastics, a thing that our restaurants can do. Uh, we have very serious problem in the oceans. 90% of the pollution in the oceans are plastics. The Pacific Gyre, the largest uh, trash dump in the world, is twice the size of the state of Texas and six feet of plastic. And um, plastics are entering the food chain, um, are bringing toxins to the food chain, and currently affect over 200 marine species, including whales, sea turtles, seabirds, crabs, sharks, and so forth. And if we continue on the path we are on, by the year 2050, we will have more plastic in the ocean by weight than we do fish. That's how much plastic we have in the ocean. The other planetary boundary that I want to touch on is the nitrogen phosphorus overload, uh, creating uh, problems from ocean pollution. 80% of ocean pollution is land-based, and that's created 400 dead zones around the world we need to reduce our fertilizer um, pollution. One of the strategies is to simply ban it, and we're doing that in communities in our observatories, at least in certain seasons of the year. Another is promoting local organic and hydroponic food. Uh, Anna Marie Island, which you saw in the video, has been a leader um, in doing that. Um, as I mentioned, uh, they have a, a tag, they call themselves the greenest little um, town in America. They have 30 edible gardens lining their main street. Um, they have uh, referred to themselves as the mullet capital of the world. They contract with uh, the Gamble Creek Farm to supply all the restaurants with organic or hydroponic food. Uh, they compost that, and now they're looking into biodigester. They also are looking at invasive species like lionfish and uh, wild pigs. Um, they've created energy efficient uh, hurricane-resistant buildings with historical architecture intact. The 30 gardens have inspired many local gardens, and that's contributing as well. Um, sustainable agriculture at, at the restaurant is coming through the, the farms and different contracts. There's also the issue of waste. Uh, one of the best models I've found is the Disney Second Harvest Program that's feeding 1,000 children a day from just leftover food in restaurants. And, um, conferences and conventions. Uh, about um, 704,000 pounds of food 
in four different counties. And finally, I want to conclude with a project I'm most excited that I've been working with this year, the Village's Nature in, uh, uh, outside of Paris, France. They started with the idea that any restaurant or hotel can do is look at the fact that if you live in Europe, the European lifestyle would take three planets to support if everybody in the world lived that way. And if you live like North Americans, it would take at least five planets. So the question they started with, what would it take to develop tourism as if we only had one planet? And they developed all these different uh, metrics to do that. And in the case of food, they looked at how they can have partnerships for sustainable, uh, humane, um, and healthy diets um, higher on the vegetable and organic um, uh, line. They've also addressed climate change through the energy efficient, passive solar buildings, the utilization of uh, geothermal, and providing their communities and guests um, before they even come the best way to get there using less carbon. They actually uh, have a long range goal to have no cars allowed in the village, but they're not starting there. They're starting with maybe 30% uh, come with mass transit and then going up um, from there. So these are all um, strategies um, to be zero carbon from day one. They're not only going to be zero carbon for the resort, they're going to produce enough renewable energy to supply 30% of the Euro Disney theme parks and 30% of the Disney Paris Hotel. So they're going to be taking CO2 out of the atmosphere through a new development rather than just being carbon neutral. And I think that's a, a major um, significant thing. In terms of waste, uh, the nitrogen phosphorus overload, they are not um, uh, doing anything they, that uses fertilizers in the resort itself. They have a policy to promote restaurants and shops with local and organic products and utilize uh, local farmers markets and a policy uh, to favor on-site production and local regional food as a preference. So they actually have a farm at the resort. Now the farm doesn't produce a very high percentage of their food, but it serves a very educational value where they teach gardening, they teach animal husbandry, they teach um, how to use greenhouses and uh, so forth. And then in the biodiversity, uh, all the buildings use 100% F SC certified wood. They maximize uh, local wood. And they have inventoried 72 species uh, to protect in the process, making sure the environmental corridors are kept intact uh, through their development. And they are doing everything they can to enhance biodiversity, not just to reduce um, loss. So I'm going to stop right here and uh, introduce our panel members. Um, <clears throat> The first speaker that we have, if I get my notes here, Franklin Carpenter. Franklin is a member of the board of directors of Chile's Federation of Tourism Companies and director of the hotel tourism and gastronomy area at INACAP, a nationwide integrated system of higher education, which trains future technicians and professionals in order to contribute to the economic and social cultural development of the regions of the countries, highlighting the importance of gastronomy as a catalyst for development. He's the promoter of the program that is focused on the development of gastronomy in Chile, and we welcome him warmly as our first panelist. So please welcome Franklin Carpenter. Thank you, David, for that presentation. Thank you all for joining us here today. Let me just open my presentation. Oops.
just oh, try sorry. again. Sorry about this. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry about the delay. Well, um, I'd first like to thank GSTC and the local organizers for inviting us today to be able to tell you about a project that we've been working on for the past 18 months and which is called Sabores de Chile, which if we translate to English would be Flavors of Chile. And this project is about the sustainable development of Chile's culinary heritage. So um, I believe that when all of you travel to different countries, one of the expectations that you have is to be able to try uh, the different flavors and preparations of that country you're visiting. And I do believe that when you decided to come to Chile and come to the Patagonia, you also had uh, the idea of trying the different preparations and foods that, were, that are characteristic of this region of the country. If, um, when we ask tourists that visit Chile, what's the main activity they do when they come to this country, 58% of them say that they try typical food and that they visit restaurants. Those are the two main activities they do. But when you ask them if gastronomy is a motivation for them to visit this country, that doesn't appear. So food is not a motivation for tourists to visit Chile. And that is something that um, surprises us, or at least worries us, because neighboring countries like Peru do have an important amount of their visitors that are motivated um, to indulge the experience of their culinary heritage, like Peru, for example. Um, so the industry realized that there's an issue and that something had to be done. We all acknowledge the importance of food during the visitor's experience, but was the industry worried about if those visitors were choosing, preferring, or were being um, intendedly uh, told to go and, pr and try Chilean food. So, um, this program, which is called Sabores de Chile, had the main objective to indulge visitors and tourists with the Chilean cuisine experience. That was the objective of this program that started, as I said before, 18 months ago. And the interesting thing is that most of government authorities related to tourism and all the private sector that includes associations related to tourism are, were all interested as well in supporting this program. So the first thing that happened was that we created a public and private alliance in order to be able to support this program during the following 18 months. And um, what we decided, those that worked in this program, was that there were four main uh, strategic pillars that had to be developed in order to be able to start working on the Chilean culinary experience. And those were heritage, sustainability, service experience, promotion, and networking. As David mentioned before, I represent an academic institution in fact, this institution, which is called INACAP, exists all over this country. It's a system, an integrated system of education. In all, we have 135,000 students studying different programs in all 12 areas that these institutions have. One of those areas is hotel tourism and gastronomy. So, us, as the academic partner of this program, had the opportunity to take all of our students, gastronomic students, that are spread around all the country, all the regions of the country, to work in this program. So how do we intend to enhance our culinary heritage for tourists and the industry? Well, the first thing we did, and this, is, was, this was probably uh, the main support that our school gave to this project, 
was that we geo-referenced uh, all of the restaurants that had on their menus Chilean typical food. And that was quite something. Even though we managed to um, discover 400 restaurants around the country that serve typical Chilean food, we also find, found that many of them that said that served typical Chilean food were not really typical Chilean food. So that was the importance of students and teachers work in all the, of the regions of the country. The next thing we did was to do an inventory of our heritage recipes. And then that wasn't easy work either because we had to define what was heritage for Chile and what we understood as culinary heritage. So that was quite a lot of work done by chefs, professionals and experts in order to get to a definition of what was understood by culinary heritage. Finally, we were able to develop 170 recipes that were considered to be heritage, Chilean heritage recipes. Adding to that, we also um, were able to identify 45 different produce from the different regions of the country that were the main or principal ingredients of all of these recipes. Well, wh where does the sustainability come into this project? Well, uh, we asked the question, how do we aim to enhance the sustainabilities of restaurants? Which is a difficult question, because as we heard earlier on, um, when Andres mentioned that the government supports tourism operators and hotels to get the sustainability certifications, it's even more difficult for restaurants to do that because there is no sustainable certification available here at least in this country. So we had to do some research and we had to discover what kind of um, criteria and aspects of the different standards of sustainability from the, from the tourism industry, from the food industry, and in general, that could fit in for our restaurants to be able to uh, certify in sustainability. And then we found the great help here of Simon from Food Made Good that was of great support in order to be able to identify the different criteria that would form part of a future certification for the restaurant industry in the country. So quickly, I show you in those pictures that you're seeing there, and luckily they're in Spanish. But finally, we were able, we were able to identify 62 criteria for this sustainability distinction, which in the future, we pretend to create this sustainable certification. Well, um, just to move on quickly, after that, we uh, realized that it was also important to be able to work on the server's experience because, okay, we can have Chilean food in our restaurants, well, what's going on with service? And maybe one of the most critical points also in our restaurants and in the industry in general in Chile is service. So we also developed a series of videos and training guides so that workers, waiters from the different restaurants around the country could learn how they could uh, give a better dining experience for those who wanted to try Chilean food, okay? So, I've been told here that my time is up. I had a short video. I'm not sure if I can go on with the video. Um, maybe if we have time at the end. Okay, we'll go at the end. So, well, hopefully with uh, questions later, I can maybe go into more uh, aspects. But in the end, this is work that's been worked with um, the different actors of the industry. And we pretend to continue. Uh, we understand the importance of uh, food as a visitor's experience, and we hope that that food experience in the future will always, or at least mostly, be related to a Chilean food experience. Thank you. Our next uh, panelist is Tammy Ko. She's the Quality Assurance Manager for the Rainforest Alliance uh, Certification Division where she oversees all third-party accreditations and a global team of technical specialists responsible for the development and monitoring of systems to deliver sustainable certification services in tourism, agricultural, forestry, and related supply chains. Um, she's been working with the Rainforest Alliance since 2007. 
uh, about the same time that they were one of the founding members of GSTC. So welcome, uh, Tammy Coe. Thank you, Jamie. I'm going to stay seated so I don't have any slides, but in a moment, oh, that's better. Um, now it's working. So at Rainforest Alliance, we have a very ambitious mission to uh, conserve biodiversity and protect sustainable livelihoods by transforming land use, business practices, and consumer behavior. So part of our strategy to do that is through certifications. And we've talked this week a lot about tourism certification, but today I'm going to switch focus over to agriculture certification. Um, and talk about how the tourism industry can really make big impacts by, by sourcing sustainable products. Um, not just Rainforest Alliance certified, but there's other good certifications out there as well. Um, currently, Rainforest Alliance, we work in over 50 countries with over 100 crops. Um, we work with over 1.3 million farmers. And while some of those farms are big industrial farms, 75% of them are less than five acres in size. And we've talked this week a lot about storytelling and the importance of that. So I'd like to start a quick video right now to put what I'm going to talk about in context. Um, it's of a cocoa farmer who's actually part of the Unilever supply chain. So his cacao ends up in chocolate bars that you see with the Rainforest Alliance certified label. So please go ahead, start the video. Oui, je suis né ici, j'ai grandi ici, je travaille ici, je suis devenu planteur ici. La première des choses, André m'a dit, bon, je t'aime, je veux t'épouser. C'est ça, depuis 15 ans, depuis 12 ans ensemble. J'aime le football. Mon joueur international, c'est Didier Drogba. Ah, 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 ah. Je suis un homme qui est pour. Ah, je suis grand. Je m'appelle oh, Kofi Kwadio Adrien. Je suis un planteur, je suis tout cacao. Je suis certifié depuis 5 ans. Hein. Donc je suis à côté de mon papa. Donc ce qu'il fait, c'est ça qu'il voulait faire aussi. Quand je, il dit quand je serai grand, il va être planteur comme mon papa. Tout le village fait cacao. Bon, il y a les, mes frères, mes amis, je me salue au champ ici. On vient s'amuse, on cause, et puis bon. Hey, Mais actuellement il pleut, mais il ne pleut pas comme avant. C'est pas bon. Des fois tu mets cacao, à cause de la pluie, le cacao va, va, va mourir. Quand tu fais cacao, ça nous fatigue. Donc s'il y a quelque chose pour faire que la pluie va venir, on va vous demander de faire pour nous que la pluie va venir bien bien. Et quand tu as appris quelque chose que tu connais, il faut apprendre les autres. Quand le frère Alliance est venu, euh, depuis quand j'ai écrit mon nom dedans, euh, depuis je suis au chien école. Ce que j'ai fait là-bas, maintenant c'est pas la même chose. Le compost, là, il ne fait pas compost, les, les bois, je ne plante pas les bois, mais maintenant, comme je suis certifié, tout ça là, je, je mets en œuvre. Pour faire, pour faire bon cacao, c'est difficile, mais c'est mon travail. Si je, je fais bonne qualité, le revenu qui vient à moi, c'est bon. Ça change la vie de, de les planteurs. Thanks. So we work with the standards of the Sustainable Agriculture Network and OOTS, um, among others, but in agriculture, it's really focused on the two of those. Um, and in order to get the seal on the product, we're not only certifying the farms, but we're also using traceability systems and chain of custody auditing to ensure the supply chain so that when you see a product um, on market or a product that um, a, a uh, brand is trying to sell as certified, you have some guarantee that we've audited that supply chain or have a traceability system set up for it. Um, in doing that, we're also looking at what happens at the factory level. So health and safety issues at the factory are part of the audits too. 
Um, so it's not just looking at the farm, but it's looking at that full supply chain. And fortunately, we've, able to, we've been able to make some really big impacts. So, uh, for example, 15% of all globally produced tea is now Rainforest Alliance certified. Uh, I believe it's 14% of cacao. Uh, and we're around 6% of global production of bananas um, and coffee as well. So we've really, uh, hopefully, you're seeing those products on the shelves um, and people are being able to recognize that label to make the right consumer choices. But as the tourism industry, there's a big power, big buying, purchasing power there to source these sustainable products. I know we're talking about gastronomy today, but this also goes for wood and fiber products, furnishings, paper, um, in other sectors as well, textiles and fabrics. Um, the toiletries and cosmetics as well, shampoos and lotions, a lot of the oils that are produced from those can be sustainably sourced through our standard and others. Um, aside from certification, we also work with companies that, you know, like I said, our, our numbers are six, six to 15% you know, of market penetration. So obviously there's nobody out there, or it's very rare that someone can source 100% of their products as certified. So we also offer services where we can help companies look at their supply chain, analyze it, identify those risk areas, and identify the areas where you can make small uh, sourcing changes that'll make the most impact in terms of uh, protecting reputation um, and, and also making the most impact on environmental and social aspects as well. So that's what I'd love to talk more to anybody about today who's interested in those types of programs or learning more about certified product. Um, but that's about it. Thank you, Dave. Our third panelist is Simon Hepner, the founder of the Sustainable Restaurant Association, a UK-based organization that works with food service businesses to help them understand and manage sustainable, sustainability issues. They started in 2010 with only 25 members, which is really a good start, actually. <laughs> but they now have 6,500 member sites, including restaurants, cafes, contract caterers, airlines, and schools influence the sustainability of more than 50 million out-of-home meals a year. And so please welcome Simon Hefner to tell us more about this incredible program. Thank you. Program. Thank you very much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, and I just want to say initially a, a massive thank you to TAIF and Euro Chile for, uh, for making it possible for us to come. Um, so, I, I'm really excited that food uh, is now part of the discussion, uh, part of the sustainable tourism discussion. It hasn't been uh, explicitly part of the discussion uh, for a while, uh, and it's, it's brilliant that it is now. And I say that because, uh, for me, uh, food is probably the sustainability issue. Um, not just because of the, the material impacts that we talked about before, the limits to growth uh, material impacts through the supply chain and through the operating uh, of, of food service businesses, but also, um, and perhaps more importantly, because uh, food uh, represents a fantastic vehicle of opportunity for communicating with your customers about sustainability um, in a way that lots of the other uh, sustainability issues that we've been talking about don't. Um, we all have a, uh, a passionate, intense, um, very personal relationship with food. And through our three, four, five times a day relationship, we, are, we have an opportunity as restaurants, tour operators, destinations, to communicate to our visitors about what we're doing and what makes us a sustainable operation. And that's not just good for us, it's good for the opportunity it represents for behavior change as well. About helping those visitors understand what the opportunities are that they can then take back uh, to their own home life uh, and through that uh, catalyst uh, massively increasing the influence that we can have so it's not just our change that we're making but the change that we can make through our customers as well 
And that premise was what uh, underpinned our decision in 2010 to, to set up the Sustainable Restaurant Association. Um, both that sustainability in food service is complicated, so let's try and find a way to make it easier for restaurants, um, but also that it represents this opportunity to really accelerate change in the food system uh, towards a more positive future. Um, and so I thought it might be useful just to talk very briefly about uh, our model uh, that we, we operate in the UK, how we uh, work with food service businesses to help them become more sustainable. Um, and there are really three elements to that in, at its core. We do lots of different things, but at its core, we, we simplify sustainability, uh, we audit, uh, and then we reward. Um, and that's, that's the core of our offer. So the simplification um, was referred to a little bit um, in uh, the slides we saw about Chile. Um, it's really recognizing that the, uh, the number of issues that a food service business has to deal with is immense. Uh, it's multiple supply chain issues. It's uh, real issues of operation around energy and waste and water. And it's also lots of social issues in the way they treat staff and their engagement in the community and all of these things. And each one of those, uh, in, in the UK at least, um, is, is represented by a, a single issue organization that's trying to help businesses do the right thing. But to expect a restaurant to navigate that advisory landscape and to engage with all of those different people in order to do the right thing was, was just not happening. Um, and so our approach was to try and get in front of all of those single issue organizations and create a framework for sustainability that allowed food service businesses to understand it in the whole and to have a first point of contact. They could come to us, we can start to talk about it, and then we can put them in touch with these specialist organizations if necessary. So the, the simplification started off with a framework, um, and then now we, uh, we take a monthly thematic approach where we take one of the issues in the framework and explore it in more detail, and we have uh, communications campaigns, and we partner with, with other organizations. Um, and that allows a restaurant to have a kind of uh, momentum through the year where they know there's going to be a new activity coming up, and they can get involved in that and try and improve their operation in that sphere. Um, and then there's a, uh, an online forum and tips and, and guidance and all of that stuff. So that's the simplification bit. The audit um, is absolutely essential. It takes each one of those uh, issues uh, and asks the, uh, the business questions about it so that they can establish how they're performing. Uh, and that's essential so that they can uh, track progress over time, but also so that they can benchmark themselves against uh, the industry and the sector within the industry. Um, and so they get a report out of that that tells them how they're doing in each of these 14 focus areas and an overall score. And the, the other benefit for us is that it gives us loads of data on how the industry is performing. And we can start to look geographically about where certain issues are being managed well and where certain issues aren't within the country. And that's interesting information for uh, other organizations and the government so that they can target towards those areas. Once we've provided the audit, uh, we also are able to then assess whether the, uh, whether the restaurant is deserving of one, two, or three stars. So this is moving on to the reward part of the certification. Um, we were very lucky when we, when we launched that the Sunday Times called our star system the Michelin Stars of Sustainability. We, we would never have been allowed to do that, but because they said it, we can now talk about having the Michelin Stars of Sustainability, so it's great. Um, and there are thresholds um, and certain criteria, but if a restaurant achieves those thresholds and criteria, it gets one, two, or three stars. And they then use that on their menu, or uh, in the premises, on delivery bikes, uh, we've seen it. Uh, on staff t-shirts, we've seen it. So it's a, it's a way of displaying to customers that you've, you've reached a certain level uh, and that you are a sustainability champion. Uh, and then we also, once a year, have a, um, an awards lunch where we bring as many members of, uh, as possible together and some suppliers. And our, our president, Raymond Blanc, uh, hands out awards to restaurants that have gone above and beyond. Um, and we have that uh, on October the 5th when I get back, and we've got about 500 people coming to that event, uh, which is a great opportunity, not just to reward people, but to show them that there is this community 
uh, and that there are other people out there doing the same thing and the chance to network and, and, and find new partners. Um, and so that, in a, in a very quick, uh, brief nutshell, uh, is the core of our offer. And uh, we're a voluntary organization. We're not uh, regulated. It's not something that the government is saying you have to do. And so we have to market this offer uh, to businesses, and they have to pay to be part of it. And so a lot of our time is spent trying to find ways to motivate businesses uh, to get on board. But over the last seven years, it has been shown to be a model that works. It's a model that is working to create positive change in food service towards a more sustainable food system. And so, in a similar way, I would encourage other people to say, yes, we'll have a go at that model in our territory, in our city, in our country, whatever. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk to anyone about how we can help you with that. Thank you. Our anchor of this distinguished group of panelists is uh, Trey Scale, who began uh, traveling to Chile back in 2001, and her experience here sparked an interest in sustainable tourism. And a few years later, she even decided to make uh, a big change, leaving a corporate career to do her doctoral degree with Kelly Bricker, who some of you in GSTC uh, probably know. And after graduating, uh, she began her research and ethnographic case studies examining the role of alternative forms of tourism and the livelihood of 16 residents in this region. She began consulting with Patagonia. She moved here permanently in 2009, and she's currently teaching at the university, and we welcome her to hear her wisdom and presentation. So, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> I'm really grateful to be included in the panel, but I want to start off by welcoming all of you to Koyaiki and to Aysen. I see many people that live here and are part of the community, but I know that there are many of you that have come from, uh, from other parts of Chile and from all around the world. And I remember in uh, 2010 that we hosted the Chilean researchers in tourism research, and Dr. Bricker came and spoke at that conference, and we actually asked her, do you think we could ever have GSTC in Koyaiki? And at the time, she laughed and said, Trace, I don't think so. So it's really gratifying to have you guys here and to look at how far we've come as a destination in, in the past very few years. Um, but we know, and we are learning so much this week about how far we have to go. I don't think I'm gonna present my slides. Okay, because I want to give time for a conversation. I just want to tell you a little bit about, a, about why I'm sitting on this panel, and then we can get started, okay? Um, I worked for Campbell Brands, which is a very large food company in the U.S. for 15 years. I finished my career there as a, a director for one of their larger line of businesses, all of the food away from home. Uh, Disney was a customer of mine as were most of the airlines, as were most of the restaurant chains, including McDonald's. And uh, I worked very close to uh, New York in Philadelphia, and so was around in the U.S. during a lot of period of, of change in the tourism industry after 9-11. And I had begun to travel, and I'd gone to Chile. And by chance, I went to Fudu Le Fou. And I experienced a a connection, a sense of place with Fudu Le Fou in 2001 as a tourism destination because of its simplicity and authenticity. If we had more time, I'd tell you a story uh, that I always tell in this context, but I think I'm gonna skip it for today and just say the authentic experience that I was able to have in Fudu Le Fou changed my life, as many have experienced changes in their lives because of tourism. And there was a conversation during my trip about whether our experience was authentic and what was our role as tourists. And honestly, these were questions that I'd, I'd spent very little time considering in my livelihood, in my manner for, uh, of living in the corporate world in big cities. And I began to do a lot of reading and reflection and study. Long story short, it was not a good time to enter the tourism industry. 
And so I went back and got a doctorate degree. Very good advice at an adventure tourism conference. And I learned a lot about sustainable tourism, and in the process, I fell in love with Chile. I fell in love with Patagonia. Someone told me if I really loved Patagonia, I should know I send, because it was like food of la food 20 years before. And so, by twist of fate, I ended up here in 2003, and from then on, have been connected to this place, and I found myself in a place where tourism was just beginning. And it's been really exciting to be part of that conversation, part of that work, part of that progress. There's been millions of actors involved in this destination forming and developing. But one of the things that's been most interesting is that there's been a, a tremendous commitment to developing tourism here in Iceland with the community. We don't always know how to do that, but we have a real commitment to not necessarily uh, becoming a destination that, uh, that is dominated by large companies. We like having small businesses. We like having a very small tourism industry with 800 operators, although it's a challenge. And so I decided that it would be a good opportunity to give something back to the region of Iceland by concentrating on food, because there's a lot of amazing food here, but it's not organized, it's not categorized. We don't exactly know what the patrimony involved in culinary heritage in Aysen is. So I spent three years working on a project, and I brought a gift for you guys, in which we developed about 60 stories of people who are using elements of patrimony related to food and culinary practices in innovative ways and are open to the idea of exposing their experiences to tourists. We also developed a, a short mini-series of six episodes that's available on cable. And, and I actually want to show you just the, the trailer from that mini-series. It's only a minute, so we can get talking. All right. Este año había ahorrado mucho porque quería viajar fuera de Chile y conocer otras culturas. Tenía todo listo hasta que recibí una invitación de unas colegas para participar en un proyecto y cambié el rumbo de mi viaje por completo. Mi nuevo destino era Aysén, una región al sur de Chile en la Patagonia. El desafío era capturar con mi cámara los saberes y sabores de este lugar. Recorrimos la región de norte a sur, todo hasta llegar al fin de la carretera austral. Sin saberlo, aquí había un exquisito mundo por conocer. Me encontré con muchísimas historias de tradiciones gastronómicas. Es realmente impresionante. Aysén superó todas, todas, todas mis expectativas. Y es más, como que todavía no me creo que todo esto estaba aquí en Chile, en mi propio país. So I have about 10 things. <laughs> The mini-series is amazing. It's in YouTube. You can check it out yourselves. It really is amazing if you speak Spanish. <laughs> um, I have 10 other books, so the first 10 people that come up after, there's a book for you if you read Spanish. And I just want to close by saying that in developing this process and getting involved with the food industry in Aysen, it's very interesting, the diversity on this panel. I can tell you that this region in this moment has a lot of risk with respect to sustainability and food, not only for the practices that we need to employ related to uh, waste, related to biodiversity, related not only to sustainability, but to renovation and restoration of our ecosystems, right? Our people just got roads here 20, 30 years ago. So what happened? Immediately, they went from growing all of their own food to buying it in stores. And Nescafe became a much more trendy option than the real cafe they used to bring over from Argentina. 
So we have a lot of work, and one of the things I think about the role of food in sustainable tourism is that we have the potential to develop gastronomy here in this region that teaches our own residents how to eat the foods that their grandparents grew up on. So I think that uh, it's an exciting time to be in ISEN, and I really welcome all of you and your knowledge and think we have a lot to learn. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> So the questions are on their way up here. This is a question uh, specifically for Simon. So. Uh, this is a question from Jessica Canelo. Uh, Ch Chile is a strong wine producer and exporter, but wine is also part of our cultural heritage. Any approach of your association about wine? Um, yes. <laughs> we, we love wine in our association. Uh, there are uh, some specific things that can be done with wine to make it more sustainable, both in the production of it the growing organic biodynamic systems, um, but also in the, uh, in, in the bottling uh, and production of it. At our awards event that I talked about uh, next week, this year we are going for cask wine, uh, having previously had bottled wine, uh, because the calculations indicated that there was a 70% reduction uh, in the impact, the environmental impact, if we use this cask system rather than the bottle system. So. Uh, it's just an example of the, the sort of thing that can be done to improve the sustainability of wine. I don't know if that was specifically what you were uh, referring to, and I don't know where you are. Yeah? Thank you. Okay, our second question is uh, directed directly to Franklin here. So. Yeah. Uh, the question's in Spanish, so I'll read it out in Spanish. It says, Chiloé tiene identidad gastronómica. Todos conocemos el curanto de mariscos y verduras. ¿Cuál sería el plato o comida que identifica la región de Aysén? ¿Ya? ¿Did you catch that? ¿Ya? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Ok. Well, I, I do believe maybe Tracy, Trace, sorry, Trace, should answer that question. Um, if you ask me, and in my role as director at INACAP and of the Culinary Arts Program, which has also a campus here at Kuyaiki, um, Cordero al palo would be, how would you translate cordero al palo? Roasted lamb. Roasted lamb. I guess uh, for somebody in Chile, if they were to identify a typical dish around here, it would be that, roasted lamb. But um, I do think, and I've had the opportunity to read that book, to look at it, and it's amazing the amount of other preparations and recipes that are also part of the identity of this region uh, that is not known. That is an, a book that um, helps you discover the identity of the communities that live in this region. And there's lots of products that are there that we don't know about and that we should know, but in a sustainable way because the idea is that this uh, can be kept in the future and that our children and our grandchildren can also have the opportunity to um, indulge those flavors. Um, there's fruits that are very typical from this region, ribarbo, calafate. Um, the thing is, is that they're not uh, available all year round. So we have to also respect that, respect that um, we don't have food, same food all year round. So we have to know what food's available at each uh, season. And um, doing that, respecting that, I do think that we'll be able to work better uh, on developing the food that is available in the proper season. So maybe Trace, you should uh, uh, tell us about the secrets things. of this region. Yeah, I, I'll just say a, a couple of words. Um, first off, if you start to look at the, the patterns of the pioneers that came to this region, many of them came from Chiloé. 
Yeah? A, another group came from the region of Bio Bio. Others came from other countries. I'm not gonna go into all of the, of the details of this, but you could say that the traditions in Aysen are a, a representative of all of these different cultures that came with their own food traditions. We're only talking about a region where the pioneers were here 120 years ago when they began, yeah? But what happened is that to come to Aysen before roads, before, when, when really the naturaleza was so enormous, before the fires, you just can't imagine how lush and beautiful this region would have been. Uh, people immediately took those traditions that they had in their home countries and began to meld them with the naturaleza, or with nature. Sometimes I forget. And so immediately they began to begin their own traditions. I'll just mention just two or three. One, uh, there were a lot of uh, people that came from Arab countries, from, uh, from Libya, from Syria, that were escaping the Turkish Ottoman Empire, that found themselves in Patagonia and began to try to, to reproduce some of their traditions and culture with the ingredients that they could find here. So you find some of that food here. You also find many uh, traditional Chilean uh, dishes from Chiloé, as well as a lot of dishes that are influenced by the Mapuche culture. Although many of our residents don't know that that's where the influence for those dishes had come from. Great, thank you. Uh, Franklin didn't get a chance to share his video, so I'm wondering if we could play uh, his video now. It's just a couple minutes um, in doing that. And while they're um, setting that up, While they're setting up the video, if any of the panelists have questions of other panelists, you might be thinking of those we might have a minute to ask. The video is ready.
um, any of the panelists have any questions of any of the other panelists? Or no? Well, I want to thank uh, all of you. You've been a great audience for this presentation. And I want to personally invite you, if you're interested in learning more about what we're doing in Anna Marie Island, which you saw in the introductory video, we're holding a conference the end of October. And I'd like to invite uh, each and every one of you to attend that if you're interested. I will have uh, more information emailed out to you on that. Uh, thank you very much. You've all been great. Agradecemos entonces a los panelistas por esta participación que han tenido con nosotros. Por favor, les entregamos un presente de la organización. Um, tengo un aviso acerca de las personas que están inscritas para el post-tour del día de mañana a Cerro Castillo. Por favor, confirmar su asistencia en el mesón de registración. Sí o sí tiene que ir a confirmar, si va o si no va. Por favor, vaya a confirmar su participación al mesón de registración para el paseo de Pots Tour a Cerro Castillo el día de mañana. Uh, ahora, bueno, vamos a pasar a un coffee break y los esperamos para el plenario de... Lleva por título Gestión Sustentable para los Visitantes. Los esperamos de regreso a las 16.30, por favor.